Hi. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is you're watching this. And as always, happy whatever day it is you're watching this. Welcome to edition 46 of Left Side of the Aisle. This is for March 1st to 7th, 2012. I'm your host. My name is Larry Erickson. And for the next almost half hour, I'm going to be your renter and raconteur. I'm going to be talking about things important to me I think deserve your attention. As always, if you have any comments, questions, whatever about the show, you can email me directly. My email address is hoviating, that's W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G at AOL.com. And if you didn't catch that, my um, website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, will be up over here somewhere a couple times during the show. And uh, you can get the email address from there. The, uh, the one thing I ask is that if you do email me, if you would, in the subject line, include something like, your show or left side of the aisle or something so I know it's not spam and be a little patient. I do answer my mail, sometimes a little slow about it. All right, this is another week that I really wish I had an hour. Uh, there's a long list of things I simply am not going to have time for that I really wanted to include, but since I can't, I might as well stop grousing about that and get to the stuff I am going to cover. Uh, so I'm going to start with a bit of good news and I always like to start with good news where I can, although I suppose it uh, says something about um, what's going on these days that it always seems to be this particular area where all the good news comes from. But anyway, the good news is that uh, a couple of weeks ago, about two weeks ago, the Obama administration took another step toward acceptance and recognition of same-sex marriage. Uh, the Department of Justice announced that it would no longer defend in court legislation that bans same-sex couples from receiving military and veterans benefits. Uh, now, Attorney General Eric Holder said that um, the legislative record of the Defense of Marriage Act, or, or the DOMA as it's known, um, he said it contains nothing, it contains no rationale for providing benefits to spouses, in, uh, veterans benefits and military benefits to spouses of opposite sex couples while denying them to spouses of same sex couples who are legally married. Um, he also argued that the DOMA uh, and other provisions of U.S. law that deny such benefits to both civilian and um, veteran same sex couples are unconstitutional when, uh, when they're applied to same-sex couples who are actually married legally. Now, this statement comes in response to a suit filed in Massachusetts by the, legal, by the, um, the uh, service men members Legal Defense Fund. Um, and it comes about just about a year after Holder announced that the Department of Justice would no longer defend in court the guts of the Defense of Marriage Act on the grounds that the act was unconstitutional when subjected to the heightened judicial scrutiny that is applied to laws that involve um, uh, discrimination on race or gender. Uh, heightened judicial scrutiny means that laws that discriminate have to pass a stricter test in order to justify them. And they say when that test is applied, this law fails. Um, now, this, this decision might give some comfort to some courts that have been a little bit, eh, a little bit skittish, maybe is a good word, uh, about declaring that um, laws against same-sex marriage are unconstitutional. But at the same time, it, of course, uh, generated howls of spluttering, frothing rage among the denizens of the dark side, that area where neither light, nor logic, nor fact, nor simple human decency is ever allowed to penetrate. To um, consider one such denizen of the dark side, we need look no further than Republican presidential candidate Rick I should be in a sanitarium. He recently invoked rule number 10 in my uh, list of uh, debating tactics for right-wingers looking to avoid responsibility in actual debate. I talked about this list before, maybe I should again at some time. Anyway, Rule number 10 is accuse the accuser. Uh, speaking to a, uh, a group of fellow mouth breathers at a campaign rally in Michigan recently, uh, um, I, uh, I should be in a sanitarium, said that liberals are the real bigots in the debate over same-sex marriage. As proof of this, he quoted the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals decision that uh, upheld a lower court decision that California's infamous prop hate that bans same-sex was actually unconstitutional. 
Santorum said um, that the decision amounts to the court saying, quoting him, if you believe marriage is between a man and a woman, it is either because you are a hater or a bigot. Yes, that is what it means. All right, moving on to another bit of good news, actually mixed news here. There's some good news and some bad news. So good news first. Uh, last week in an unexpected development, the Virginia State Senate uh, rejected uh, for now that state's proposed personhood law. This law would have conferred personhood on what right-wingers, for their own reasons, continually um, label and what the media, for some reason, continually parrots what they call unborn children. Uh, this would have applied not only to fetuses, but to embryos and even zygotes. Now, let's get something straight, okay? There is no such thing as an unborn child. If it's not born, it's not a child. Uh, calling a fetus an unborn child makes exactly the same sense as calling a caterpillar an unborn butterfly, calling a tadpole an unborn frog, and calling an acorn an unborn oak tree. Now, I can understand a pregnant woman and her partner thinking of that fetus as, you know, her unborn child, making that emotional connection with her, what will be her child when it's born. But we can't let that emotional connection define the term in law, and nor can we allow it to ignore the science. There is no such thing as an unborn child. Well, anyway, getting back to the bill, uh, this, the bill had already passed the Virginia House of Delegates. It was expected to pass the state Senate on a tiebreaker vote, but to the surprise of a lot of people, the leadership in the Senate uh, agreed to basically put the whole thing off until next year. So the bill is dead, at least for now. Um, it doesn't mean it's completely dead. It could still haul its sorry zombie butt out of the grave next year and start try again. But for now, it's dead. So that is a victory, a very real definite victory, but at the same time, it's a rather bitter one, because while it killed this bill, uh, the Virginia legislature also passed that bill that you probably heard about that would require women to have an ultrasound. Uh, any woman who wants to terminate her pregnancy has to have an ultrasound. Apparently, the thinking was that pregnant women, the poor ignorant dears, have to have it explained to them what being pregnant means. Now, this bill and uh, um, the amendments that were proposed to make the bill uh, to make this an optional treatment to uh, require insurance companies to cover it or the state to pay for it or to exempt women who did not have medical insurance um, were all rejected. So what this means is these women are not only going to be required to have a quite probably completely unnecessary additional medical procedure, they're going to have to pay for it out of their own pockets. Now, in its original form, this bill would have required uh, intravaginal ultrasounds, which is exactly what it sounds like. An intravaginal ultrasound, uh, if, if this was at a point where the fetus was not yet developed enough for a regular ultrasound to be revealing. In the face of understandable outrage about this, the um, main sponsor of the bill supposedly amended it to remove the state mandate for, a, for an intravaginal ultrasound, but left in the requirement for the information that the procedure would reveal. So, uh, in other words, this put doctors now in the position of either forcing women to have this procedure, making them just wait till some point later on, uh, failing the reporting requirements, thereby risking prosecution and loss of their license, or simply refusing to do the procedure altogether. It really just simply means, in effect, that the mandate to force this unnecessary procedure on women has simply been shifted from the state to the doctor. As far as the women is concerned, are concerned, it won't have changed anything. But still, let's, let's um, go back and, and you know, enjoy the failure of the personhood bill. 
because it does have some significance. The failure to push through yet another restriction on women's reproductive rights does have some importance, especially since this comes during a flurry of state level bills to attack those rights. Um, we find ourselves, and in fact, a lot of these cases, we find ourselves having to re-argue issues that rational people thought were settled years ago. So here's something you need to realize and need to remember. When I talk here about reproductive rights, I'm not just talking about abortion. I'm talking about birth control because birth control is under attack. I mentioned this actually uh, two weeks ago, it was. I said that uh, a lot of folks who have been advocating for women's reproductive rights had said that abortion was only the first salvo in a war on these rights uh, and that restrictions on abortion would be followed by restrictions on birth control. And a lot of people were mocked for that, say, oh, that's silly, don't be, don't be dumb. But that's exactly what we're seeing now. We're seeing attacks on birth control. See, we got to remember that... Um, the, the right-wing religious fanatics have never forgotten that not very long ago time when it was illegal to use contraceptives even in a marriage, and even married couples could not legally use contraceptives, and that wasn't that long ago. They've never forgotten that. And the right-wing fanatics, eager to exploit the religious fanatics for their own ends, have happily joined with them in a campaign to roll back time. And as an example, a good example, just consider again, I've talked about this before, but consider again that federal mandate that says that um, employees of religious affiliated organizations must have access to health coverage for reproductive, uh, reproductive things, for, for birth control, even as those same employers don't have to pay for it. Now, despite the fact that they don't have to pay for it, this has, again, of course, generated howls of phony, um, carefully orchestrated, ginned up outrage over this supposed attack on religious freedom. Indeed, it's an attack on religion itself. Uh, in other words, what they're saying is it's an attack on the concept of religion. If, say, a Catholic school cannot interfere with the ability of a Jewish employee to obtain birth control by making it more expensive by forcing them to pay the entire cost out of their own pocket. And the thing is, it's not just the Catholic bishops who are pompously bloviating about their deep moral concern about contraception, like, like they have any basis to express moral concern on anything after decades of enabling pedophiles. Um, it's also not just the obviously loopy organizations like the American Family Association or the obviously wacko politicians like Rick, I should be in a sanitarium and Newt Grinch ranting and raving about an attack, a war on Christianity. It's also others, like our very own Senator Scott Brown, who uh, has a radio ad out now where he calls this um, federal mandate, you got it, an attack on religious freedom. Now, in some cases, such as Scott Brown, the driving force appears to be plain old-fashioned political opportunism, that, uh, that classic business of giving up any shred of self-respect in order to suck up to a potential voting bloc. But for others, it's important to understand this is actual conviction. They actually believe this. They actually believe that um, church law should not simply inform public law, it should actually determine public law. And for an obvious example, we go right back to Rick, I should be in a sanitarium. He first attacked President Hopi Changi a couple of weeks ago on the grounds that when the legendary Mr. O looks at world problems, he doesn't do it through a lens of biblical theology. He followed that up a week later by saying that there is no separation between church and state, that separation is not absolute, he said, because what, what this actually means is that religion should be free of government but government should not be free of religion. In fact, his more revealing term, he said, government should not be free of the church. 
Now, to make sure no one misunderstand him, he doubled down on his statement from last fall. Uh, he said he read JFK's 1960 speech when John Kennedy, as a candidate for president, went before, I, I think it was a Baptist audience, to assure them that as president, despite being a Catholic, he would not be taking orders from the Pope, which you know, a lot of you may be too young to remember this. That was a genuine concern for people at the time, that a Catholic president would be taking orders from the Pope. So he said, no, I'm a Catholic, but I believe in separation of church and state, and I'm not going to be taking orders from the Pope. Well, Ricky Boy said that made him want to throw up. Now, um, he backed off somewhat on the... Um, throw up comment. But the thing is, what's important to realize here is that despite that, he actually believes this. This is not, when he talked about that throw up comment, this is not pandering. He believes this. In fact, backing off on the throw up comment was more pandering than the original comment was. And this guy's been winning elections. Despite the greater attention, I mean, he started to win, more and more attention was being paid to him and to his extremism. Despite that, he nearly won Michigan. And as the time at which I'm doing this, he's ahead in the polls in several of the important states for Super Tuesday. Now, I don't think Ricky Boy has any chance of winning the nomination for president. And even if he did, he has no chance in hell of winning the general election. And actually, I think he knows that for reasons I'll get back to. The important point here is that he has demonstrated that there is a constituency today in the United States for that kind of religious extremism. All right, we're going to take a quick break here. I'm going to come back because I've got more to say on this. Okay, quick break. Okay, we're back. Um, several days ago, columnist David Sirota um, had a piece that suggested there, there are progressives, a lot of them, who are saying that, um, at least supposed progressives, who are saying that the longer the GOP primaries go on, the better it is for progressives because people will really see, you know, just how nutsoid the, the Republicans really are. Um, and Sirota saying, eh, that's a fess. Don't be quite so gleeful. Um, the problem is he sees it, and I agree with him, which is why I'm bringing this up, uh, is that the longer the primaries go on, the longer that very extremism is on display, the longer the wildly reactionary nitwit ideas are bandied about, the more the jaw-dropping inanities get spewed. The longer that goes on, by that same token, the longer that very same inane reactionary extremism is given a mainstream platform. Uh, it's treated as a collection of serious positions that deserve serious responses from the other candidates. And so the more it becomes part of the normal political discourse in our society and our country. Now, in some TV show or another, I don't remember which one it was, it's not important. Uh, there were these two progressives, both guys, uh, who were asked about this, and they just sort of dismissed it out of hand. They said, don't be silly. Um, they embraced precisely the sort of happy talk groupthink that uh, everybody will see the Republicans are nuts kind of thing that Sirota was actually warning against. The thing is, what, where their failing lies and where Sirota's importance lies is that these two guys were thinking strictly in terms of the Republican uh, prospects for the 20 2012 presidential elections. Sirota was thinking beyond that. In fact, he specifically said this might help in the short term, but he's worried about the long haul. Because we've seen this over and over. We have. We've seen it over and over. Um, this is how reactionary ideas get mainstream. This is how, um, I mean, what happens is people like some, some flake, like Rick, I should be in a sanitarium, start spewing and just keep spewing and spewing and spewing until after a while the ideas don't seem so weird, if only because they're familiar. And then at some point, some not quite as flaky right-wingers pick up on it, they amplify it, it gets spread from there, and the first thing you know, it's regarded as a serious position worthy of serious debate. Now, Sirota refers to the Goldwater Principle in this piece. And for those of you, again, too young to remember, this refers to the presidential campaign of conservative Republican Barry Goldwater in 1964. In that election, he lost to Lyndon Johnson so badly 
that there was actually concern expressed in some quarters about whether the Republican Party could survive as an institution. I mean, uh, the Goldwater principle, in effect, suggests that even though he lost that election, the attention he got and the serious respectful attention that he got helped to move what constitutes the center of our political debate further to the right. So I mean, I, I've been talking about this, I have to tell you, I've been talking about this literally for nearly three decades. I call such races successful losses, and I have several examples I can cite, cases where you lost, but you moved the debate in your direction. Uh, everyone agree, I think, just about everyone agree, that the political debate in this country has moved to the right in recent decades. And this is how it works. I mean, this is how it's done. This is how right-wing ideas get moved from the fringe to the mainstream. How they, get, uh, how they move from mock to mainstream, from spooky to serious, from ridicule to reasonable. And birth control is just the latest example of this. I mean, go back to Goldwater, okay? In 1964, he lost so badly, people were wondering if the Republican Party could survive. Four years later, Richard Nixon was elected. Richard Nixon would now be regarded as too liberal to have a chance of getting the Republican nomination. And 12 years after he was first elected, Ronald Reagan was elected, and the Republicans regained the Senate for the first time in nearly 30 years. A successful loss. I mean, our political debate has moved far enough to the right now that witless Romney can call Rick, I should be in a sanitarium, quoting big labor's favorite senator without being laughed off the political stage. And this happens because the right wing has the confidence and the patience to say what they think, to say what they want, to say it over and over and over again, looking for the long-term victory. Now, I don't think Rick, I should be in a sanitarium, really thinks he's going to win the nomination. I doubt he really thinks he's going to win the presidency. He may dream of it. I'm sure he does. But I really don't think he seriously thinks he's going to win it. The thing is, he's not thinking of 2012. He's thinking of 2016. He's thinking of 2020 and what he can do to move the debate that way while too much of the so-called left in this country can't get its brain past the 2013 inaugural parade. Republicans think strategically. That is an area in which the left has, by and large, failed miserably, and we ignore that fact to our peril. Okay, moving on now to something else entirely, to our occasional feature, uh, Everything You Need to Know. Uh, this is where you can learn a lot about something very, very quickly. In this case, you can learn a lot about what's wrong with our attitudes about about uh, gun violence and its roots in just three sentences. A teenager, as I'm sure you know, recently shot up a school cafeteria in a suburb of Cleveland. Uh, he killed, as of this moment, three are dead and uh, two more are wounded. I read a number of mainstream media accounts of that tragedy, including from USA Today, the Associated Press, the New York Times, CNN, Reuters, CBS, the Cleveland Plain Dealer, and even one from the Seattle Times about several other gun-related incidents in schools in 2012. Not one of those accounts included the phrase, or anything even vaguely related to the phrase, gun control. And that is everything you need to know. All right, now, something else I wanted to mention very quickly, Bradley Manning. He's the U.S. Army private who's accused of leaking classified documents to WikiLeaks. He appeared before a military judge at Fort Meade in Maryland uh, on February 24th to hear the formal charges against him. There were 22 of them, and if he's convicted on all of them, he could be sent to prison for life. At this hearing, he chose to defer making a plea and to defer his choice about a judge or jury trial until the case is continued in a couple of weeks. The idea that this whole thing is a sham, just a kangaroo court, was given some credence by the fact that the judge sat there and insisted she knew absolutely nothing about the case other than the name Bradley Manning and that it had something to do with classified material. And by the way, somebody who's not reticent about their knowledge of the case, Barack Obama. Last April, he said that Bradley Manning is guilty. He said, quote, he broke the law, unquote. So much for guilty, uh, innocent till proven guilty. The thing is, though, I really said that just to have a chance to say this. 
Bradley Manning is among this year's nominees for the Nobel Peace Prize. Now, I rather doubt he'll win. For one thing, there were 230 other nominees. But to tell you the truth, I really hope he does win. All right, last this week, but by no means least, our regular feature, The Outrage of the Week. And for this week's outrage, we turn again to the United States Supreme Court. On Tuesday, February 28th, the court heard oral arguments in a lawsuit uh, accusing the multinational oil corporation Royal Dutch Shell of human rights abuses. The plaintiffs are the relatives of seven Nigerians who were killed by that country's former military regime. It's based on the fact that Shell and apparently other firms actually encouraged uh, and enlisted that government in suppressing opposition to oil exploration in the Niger River Delta in the 1990s. It was filed under the Alien Tort Statute. This is a law that dates back to 1789, uh, and in essence says that a foreign national can sue here for violations of international law. This kind of resembles the legal principle in criminal law known as universal jurisdiction, which is the idea that certain crimes under international law are so bad they're an affront to everyone everywhere, not just to uh, the people where it happened. Now, the plaintiffs say that the charges in this case of torture, prolonged arbitrary detention, extrajudicial executions, and other crimes against humanity clearly fall within the scope of the alien tort statute. But during oral arguments on the case, the conservatives on the Supreme Court seemed determined to find a way to dismiss the suit out of hand without considering its merits. For example, Sam Alito asked, what has this got to do with the U.S., even though the law does not require any such connection? Anthony Kennedy, for his part, groused that no other nation in the world permits lawsuits charging corporations with complicity in crimes against humanity. Even though if memory serves, Kennedy was among those who in death penalty cases said he didn't care what courts in other countries said. Revealingly, by the way, Kennedy also said in the opening uh, moments of, the, of arguments that nothing in international law recognizes corporate responsibility for human rights abuses, thereby echoing the argument of the lawyer for, the, for Shell Oil, who said that the corporation couldn't be held liable because treaties refer to individual responsibility, and corporation, well, isn't an individual, is it? Which means, in fact, Kennedy was echoing the argument of the corporation before it was actually made. The other right-wingers on the court seemed inclined to agree with this line of reasoning. So what does this mean? It means that in the case of Citizens United, when it was to the benefit of the corporations to be regarded as persons so they had First Amendment rights they could use to drown our political process in unlimited amounts of money, the court said, you're persons. But in this case, where it's the, cor where it's the corporation's benefit to not be persons so that they can't be held liable for their greedy, bloody violations of international law, the court appears likely to say, you're not persons. And despite legalistic nitpicking and parsing about how if you really understood the law, you'd know how these are completely different. Despite that, that is what this means. This is what our Supreme Court is. That is our Supreme Court. And that is the outrage of the week. That's it for me for this week. Uh, we're going to get back to you uh, next week. Um, Come on down here, do a show yourself. I always like to put in a plug for public television. So do that. Let's fill up that schedule, folks. But for now, you just have the best week you possibly can. We will see you here next week.